The Tom Woods Show, episode 1952. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey everybody, Harry's, the official razor of The Tom Woods Show, is offering listeners their starter set at harrys.com slash woods. That's a five-blade razor, a weighted ergonomic handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel blade cover, a $13 value, all for just $3 at harrys.com slash woods. Hey everybody, Tom Woods here. Of course, we have to talk about what just happened in Afghanistan. And to do that, I've got Scott Horton on here, who literally wrote the book on the subject. And that book, of course, is Fool's Errand. Scott, as you know, hosts The Scott Horton Show. You can check him out at scotthorton.org. He also hosts Anti-War Radio on KPFK 90.7 in Los Angeles, editorial director of antiwar.com, and directs the Libertarian Institute at libertarianinstitute.org. He's a busy guy, and I'm thrilled that he's here to talk to us about this subject. Scott, welcome back. How are you doing, Tom? Well, I'm doing okay in spite of the world ending, and, and not because of Afghanistan, but because of the all the COVID stuff and everything else. But but I do want to talk about Afghanistan. Obviously, that's why I had you come back. And um, you and I, this is coming out on, um, oh gosh, what's today's day? So this, this is being released on August 17th, 2021. Mm-hmm. August 16th, 2021, Joe Biden addressed the country. And you and I just finished watching that so as to make this episode as timely as possible. Mm-hmm. So- We'll get to that in a minute because I I definitely want to comment on that. I have to say I was surprised at what a good and reasonable speech it was. And this is not something I expected to say. I'm sure people who just can't stand the guy, you know, like me, I don't don't, don't like Biden either, but I'm sure there are people who just, because it's Biden, they can't acknowledge anything. But that was not a bad speech in my opinion. But anyway, describe for us what we just saw with our own eyes and what it means what's been going on in Afghanistan over the past week, week and a half? Well, it's what I think the French call a coup de main, which is a massive, successful surprise attack where you just kind of win all at once. And then I've seen different definitions of whether that includes a minimal amount of casualties. You know, I, I think maybe not necessarily, but by some definitions it does. So, I mean, sort of like what uh, the Russians did in Crimea in 2014. Surprise, this belongs to us now. And then... That's it. And they really pull it off. And yeah, what, two and a half weeks, something like that. They took over essentially every provincial capital in the country. And I would have thought that they might have waited another couple of weeks till the Americans were mostly all the way out, other than just a few of the embassy staff. But in fact, their new, at least interim leader said that the Taliban themselves were very surprised at the speed of their success. And in many cases, they just walked right into military bases and just walked right into towns and just accepted surrenders from warlords and politicians and military men of all different descriptions. And one thing that was smart that they did was when they seized a military base, they would say, all right, everybody, give us your rifle and go home. They didn't even take them prisoner. Now, some of the commanders got taken out and shot, and there's some things like that. I'm not saying these are nice guys. It's the Taliban we're talking about. But they essentially moved very quickly. And also, you know, essential to their strategy was they seized major portions of the North. I don't know first, but at least second. And this is sort of heading them off at the pass and preventing a kind of Northern redoubt in, you know, predominantly Tajik and Uzbek areas in the North of the country. And so then it was like a pincher movement and just cleaning up everything in the middle there. And I I think the Hazara regions, those are the Shiites who live in the center of the country, mostly in Ghazni. They were one of the last provincial capitals, and then provinces, I think, to come under Taliban control. And then as I've been floating, I I wouldn't say I made this hard prediction. I'll tell you exactly how it's going to be or anything like that. But I have floated the idea numerous times, possibly even on your show, that when it comes down to it, it might not even be a siege or a war for Kabul at all. They might just walk right in. And in my book, which, by the way, was published four years ago today, Monday, as we're recording this, the day of Biden's speech, I predicted that Gubaldin Hekmatyar, who is the former leader, former CIA favorite and leader of Hizbi Islami, who fought against the Americans in this war over the last 20 years, that he's kind of serving as a Trojan horse type figure, it looks like, and kind of helped to grease the skids for the Taliban's takeover of the city. Although I'm not sure that that was really necessary, but it looked like he hooked up with 
the old puppet dictator, Hamid, well, President Hamid Karzai, and another warlord to try to form some kind of interim council to sort of, as they put it, to make sure to speed a peaceful transfer of power. And then, so that's exactly what happened. And the Taliban just walked right in. And by the way, as of this recording anyway, and I don't know why this would change, Tom, it looks like they're perfectly happy to leave the highway open. It's just a two-mile drive from the embassy to the airport. And of course, they're doing helicopter rides to, to evacuate the embassy staff. And, you know, I mean, the Russians and the Chinese aren't closing their embassies. And honestly, I'm not sure that the, the Americans need to close their embassy. Now, probably leaving a couple of thousand people there and all these, you know, brigades and all of this stuff is a bad idea. But I think at least for now, it looks like the Taliban would rather be clever than cruel right now. And, you know, try to act like adults about the situation. They keep emphasizing, as any mobster would do, you know, when in creating a new state, that, hey, we're here to provide security. <laughs> we're here to, you can follow the Taliban on Twitter, you know. We're here to provide law and order and to prevent bad things from happening. So that's their narrative that they're pushing right now. So I think they're trying to keep the chaos at a minimum. I was talking, last time I was on the show, I told you that. I'm in contact with an army officer who was preparing, you know, a paratrooper. They were preparing to drop a brigade of guys on Bagram Air Base to help facilitate an emergency exit. But they never had a chance to do that because Bagram Air Base was handed over to the Taliban a few days ago. And even before that, there were way too many Taliban surrounding it. And so then the Afghan National Army just turned around and gave it right up just a few weeks after the Americans left it to them. And, uh, so now all the efforts are at the Kabul airport, but it seems like everything's going okay. And it does not seem like, you know, Pol Pot coming to power and massacring everybody and this kind of thing, at least not yet. I guess we'll see how it goes. But it's been, I think, yeah, uh, from the Taliban's point of view, they couldn't have prayed for a better success. I was at just least looking, so far. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. I was just looking at an article in Newsweek. And of course, Newsweek is not, the magazine it used to be. It's just like apparently any old person can write an article for Newsweek these days. But they were citing the Costs of War Project at Brown University. Right. And saying, as of April, the U.S. has spent $2.261 trillion on the war in Afghanistan. Now, it depends on how you calculate what do you include in there. Biden, in his speech, said a trillion dollars. But let's, let's round it down to two trillion. That comes out to an absolutely staggering $273 million a day. Now, if it's $1 trillion, then that's $137 million a day, every day, for 20 years. So the average person who doesn't have the background knowledge of a Scott Horton, who literally wrote the book on the war in Afghanistan, would just look at that one fact. Think $273 million, somewhere between $137 and $273 million a day for 20 years. That's almost all the person needs to know, because after you've spent that money and the government collapses instantly. The giant fighting force you've supposedly trained runs away or disintegrates. Why would you think that staying an extra year or five years or, or another, you know, more and more hundreds of millions of dollars a day is going to change anything about that? This, to me, exposes the whole apparatus, the whole foreign policy expertise, all the think tanks, all the people involved, all the contractors, how could this possibly be more of a fiasco? What could you have worse than this <laughs> you know, that would make the American people think, maybe we better not listen to these people next time. Maybe they're just all on the take. Yep. I mean, it's kind of a rhetorical question. I don't even know what I'm expecting of you there, Scott, but just whatever your thoughts are. Yeah, look, I mean, as I often say, usually when criticizing the cops, but also when I'm criticizing the national government on foreign policy stuff, uh, this is your security force, right? That's who these people claim to be at, the baseline. If it wasn't for us, who would protect you from the danger? That's why they're here. And yet they're the ones who gave everyone cancer with all their thermonuclear testing in the atmosphere. And they're the ones who created the international Islamist brigades that have been turned against us and all of our friends and allies across the world for a generation now. They're the ones who created every crisis that they exploit for even more power. And yet, you know, the Washington Post ran a thing. They must have changed the headline by now, Tom. But yesterday, they referred to these people, I'll elaborate in a second, as America's warrior class. And then when they described them, who are they talking about? 
a bunch of generals, a bunch of soft-handed generals who've never been in a fight and a bunch of big, fat think tank idiots who also don't really know anything about the military at all or, or war, but have these ridiculous strategies that the arms dealers pay them to write. And, you know, you look at Michelle Flournoy, for example, who, as the head of CNAS, helped lobby so hard to push Barack Obama to do the search of 2009 through 12 and then got the job as Deputy Secretary of Defense for Policy implementing it. And then she wants to tell the Washington Post in 2021, ah, geez, we got there, and there were great people to work with everywhere, but geez, you know, we just were surprised at just how deep the corruption went. Uh Uh-huh. They're pouring, you know, when you talk about that $2 trillion, that's cash money just being handed out to, of course, the most ruthless who are willing to do anything to get at the head of the line to get that money. The Americans were the single most corrupting influence in this desperately poor and corrupt country. And Michelle Flournoy wants to pretend like, oh, yeah, no, it would have worked great if only for that one thing that kind of screwed us up. You know, Hillary Clinton did this in the debates when they mentioned Libya to her. And she went on and on about how that was all Barack Obama's call, not hers. And she might have advised him to do it, but still, he's the one who did it. Who am I? I'm just Secretary of State. I don't know what you're talking about. And then at the end, she says, well, and also the Libyans who refused to accept the wonderful opportunity that we had granted them or something like that. You know, they just cannot accept responsibility for their failures whatsoever. And so then they continue to make them. At this point, though, I mean, look, this is what led to the rise of Trump in the first place, right? Was they told us you're going to pick between George Bush's brother and Bill Clinton's wife. And that's who you're going to get to choose from. It's these people who've ruined everything. And... Of course, Biden is a bit of the backlash from the backlash there. But overall, the American people are absolutely burnt out and fed up with these people and their mismanaged economy and their multiple ridiculously lost and failed foreign wars. And it's just the overwhelming aspect of all this as you watch all this happening is how there will be no accountability for anyone responsible for this. And in fact, all the biggest cries for accountability are for the generals who didn't plan the withdrawal all the way perfectly instead of the generals who, I don't know, sent all those weapons and all those tank, all those armored personnel carriers and all of that equipment, all those helicopters and everything that they armed the Afghan National Army with. That's all now in the hands of the enemy. Maybe it's their fault. Maybe it's Obama's fault for not firing Gates and Petraeus and McChrystal and Clinton and hiring a new war council to advise him. (laughs) <laughs> you know, one led by Joe Biden, who already at that point didn't want to fight the Taliban anymore. And that was 12 years ago. And he wanted to fight, as, as he just said in his speech here, we're going to keep an anti-terrorism mission there. In other words, fighting mythical Arab international terrorists, which at this point don't exist in Afghanistan. And if they ever do again, I don't know what the hell he thinks he's going to do about that at that point. But that's his little caveat to full withdrawal. But as far as being obligated to prop up the government in Kabul against the Taliban who would usurp them, he's been over that for a very long time. And in fact, see, I missed the beginning of the speech, Tom, but I saw someone in my Twitter said to me, you know, quoting me that I'm right about this, that they could tell in his voice and some of the things that he said is something that I've probably mentioned to you before. Certainly, I've, I've talked about this in the past about Joe Biden, is that he really took the lead in lying us into war in 2002 for Iraq War II. He was Dick Cheney's handmaiden in the Senate, preventing the Democrats from preventing the war, which they could have done. You know, Robert Byrd was trying to filibuster it and all these things. And Joe Biden was really the big whip for the war. Then his son, Bo, the not crackhead one, went over there and got brain cancer from the burn pit. And he'd also been exposed to the burn pits in the Kosovo War or the aftermath of it. And he got brain cancer and died. And I I used to not know my footnote. Then somebody found it for me. It's a PBS interview, PBS NewsHour interview with Joe Biden, where I'm pretty sure in the interview, he says, mm, yeah, I forget who brought it up to him. But in the interview, he says, yeah, somebody showed me this book, The Burn Pits. And that's by Joseph Hickman, who's the great whistleblower of the CIA murders of three men at Guantanamo Bay in 2006, by the way, the, the great Joseph Hickman. But he also wrote this book, The Burn Pits, and there's a chapter in there about Bo Biden. 
And Joe Biden says, so there's this book about the burn pits. I got a whole chapter in there about my boy. And it turns out it was the burn pits what gave him the brain cancer and killed him. And, you know, I despise Joe Biden as much as anybody. And probably I could prove it somehow if we could measure that mathematically or whatever. But he is the father of a dead son. And he knows it's his damn fault. How could he ignore that, that it is his fault? And I, there are quotes of him before saying, you know, I'm not going to send my son over there just to protect women's rights for some people in some other country on the other side of the world. You know what I mean? Like he sounds as fed up as any guy at the bar that you talk to about this, you know? And so give him credit for that, that he just doesn't believe. Same with Donald Trump. It's not like they believe in peace and believe in what's right, but they don't believe in this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, oh, I mean, I remember you telling me, I mean, he mentioned that he didn't support the surge. Right. And the surge was politically popular, I think. Right. Or at least a lot of people pointed to it as, well, we had the surge and this did this and that. But I'll say, after having watched it, and yeah, I missed the very beginning also, but I was thinking to myself, oh my gosh, this sounds like a damn good speech to me. <laughs> I was all ready to rip it apart or something, uh, figuring it's Joe Biden giving a speech. There's no way it can be anything other than self-serving. Yeah. But I thought it was a, a very, very sensible speech. Now, but let me play devil's advocate with that speech for a minute. Okay. Because the kind of argument that you heard on Twitter the other day that I don't think he really addressed in the speech was this, that you could make reasonable arguments that we've been there too darn long, we're not accomplishing anything, everybody, it's an open secret, nothing's getting accomplished, and it's time to go while at the same time saying the actual withdrawal itself could have been handled better and was a fiasco. What do you think about that kind of argument? Well, you know, I don't know, man. It, it, again, I got to say, like, I'm not exactly sure what it was supposed to look like, but they did have, I mean, seriously, yesterday morning, the Taliban puts out a statement saying, we have an agreement. And by yesterday, I mean Sunday morning here. We have an agreement with Ashraf Ghani, the president, that he's going to leave town and we're going to take over and we're going to have a peaceful transfer of power and we don't want to fight. And then that's what happened. And I'm saying that could be so much worse. I think all the panic is essentially about the presumption of what are the Taliban going to do when they get to Kabul? But so far, you know, I read there's a great journalist I'm following on Twitter who I've interviewed numerous times in the past about Afghanistan and Yemen and other places named Matthew Akins. And he said, you know, hey, Taliban are patrolling around two men at a time, like traffic cops, basically, or neighborhood patrol, patrolling around with their AK-47s, calmly pointed at the ground. They're not picking fights. They're not searching houses. They're not rustling people up, at least as of right now. It seems to be calm. Kids are going to school. The day is proceeding. And so, again, look, these guys, the Taliban, make terrible choices sometimes, Tom, and I don't know what's going to happen. But really, the, the worst of all the Mujahideen you know, Jalaluddin Haqqani is dead. Gulbuddin Hekmatyar is an old man who just, I saw an interview of him from the other day saying, we need peace now, enough fighting after all this time. So the fact that the Taliban are taking over the country, man, that was going to happen no matter what. So people, if that's the fiasco, is that the Taliban won the war? Well, I got news for you, pal. America lost the war minimum a decade ago. This has just been a holding pattern. And as far as devil's advocate, Here's an argument that's being made. Well, geez, if we just left a few thousand troops, then this wouldn't have happened. But that's just not true. The reason our guys haven't been fighting the Taliban this whole time is because we've had a ceasefire in effect with the Taliban since 2018. We haven't been fighting them at all. And they haven't been fighting our guys at all. And someone uh, sent me a tweet where Ben Shapiro, the conservative columnist or podcaster guy, was saying, well, we haven't had a casualty in over a year. This is a low-cost thing to keep doing. No, no, no. That was because we had a ceasefire. If we had, and Biden says this in the speech, and he's right, that, and he said this five weeks ago in his speech then too, that if we broke the ceasefire and said we're staying, i.e. at Bagram Air Base or something like that, well, then we'd be back at war. And then that wouldn't mean leaving a few thousand troops. That would mean re-escalating and sending another 10 or 15 or 20 or how many do you think we're going to need? And then as we've seen with every escalation over 20 years, yeah, they're guerrillas. Of course, when you send the Marines, they fade away. And the Marines get to stand there and plant a flag until they turn around and leave, at which case the flag gets torn right back up again and the insurgents come right back up again. 
as we saw with the massive surge up to 140,000 troops under Barack Obama's government in 2009 through 12. All they did was make it worse. When the surge was over, there were more Taliban than ever before. Big surprise. And so what are they going to do? And that's why they're leaving. They lost the war. They would have to do a massive escalation, and then that would only be temporary, and then it would be counterproductive over even the medium term. And then what? And all in support of a government in Kabul that does not have the support of the people. It doesn't have the support of anybody, you know, east of the Rhine, <laughs> you know? But I guess they're saying what they mean is, look at all these people desperate to get out, and, and maybe we should have thought about that and arranged yeah. for their timely withdrawal. I mean, even then, they just need the guys at Disney to set up the little cones and let everybody take their turn. I don't see the Taliban, at least so far, and maybe by the time this comes out, I'll look like an idiot. It's possible. I don't know if it's ever happened before, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll see. So far, they seem to be letting everybody leave. You know, these people who are clinging on to the side of a plane that's trying to take off. That's a bad bet, dude. Maybe just wait around. We got crackers. I mean... <laughs> I don't know. I'm looking at those mob scenes at the airport and I'm like, man, can you imagine if it'd be that easy to get on a plane, just walk up the stairs and get on a plane? I remember those days. I was a little kid, but I remember those days. Well, let's talk about the part where uh, he does try to, and actually took a swipe at Trump in the speech. And he said that Trump set a deadline of May 1st of withdrawing and that Trump himself had already drawn down American forces very substantially. Right. So it's, that I didn't quite get, because if you're saying it's a good thing for us to get out, why wasn't it a good thing? Are you implying that it was bad of Trump to have done that, even though obviously you're trying to get him to zero? So I, I don't quite get that. What did you think of the uh, of the Trump part of what he said? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what's the point of passing the buck there. If there's fault there, it's his fault for extending the deadline, you know, when the deal was for May 1st. And it was strictly for political reasons, right? They didn't want, they were risking that if the withdrawal looked good and people liked it, that it would be something that Trump had done, that Biden just carried out. They wanted it to be Biden's withdrawal, I guess. So they bumped the date by a few months. But what that means is, you know, we're talking May 1st was the deal. Well, that's the start of fighting season over there. Or not the start, but, you know, early in fighting season over there. So if they wanted their decent interval where the Americans and their friends could get on an airplane and get the hell out of town before everything collapsed all around them, it would have been back in, you know, to start back in May. And by, you know, giving in to the Pentagon and probably his political advisors and delaying the thing, he just gave the Taliban the opportunity to get that much further in their goals. But again, look, I mean, when Trump came in, he escalated from about 5,000 up to about 10,000 or 12,000, something like that. So that was some Green Berets fighting ISIS in the Nangarhar province. And it was some Marines down in Helmand, just stationed with the Afghan army down near Lashkargah, the capital of the Helmand province. And that was pretty much it. You know, what was holding off a large scale assault like this previously was the idea that we'd come back in force and or would unleash massive air power against Taliban fixed positions. So they're staying in guerrilla mode all the way up until the last minute. Once they have massive fixed positions, in other words, once they seize provincial capitals, then they make real targets out of themselves. So in other words, they've been ready to do this for years. And it was just a matter of the last Americans getting on the plane and pulling out. And then, you know, once they hand over Bagram Air Base, that was probably the green light that let's go ahead and do this. Uh, something like that. And then, as I say, they sort of snap their fingers and control the whole country in no time flat. So more soldiers weren't going to make any difference there. If there's a criticism here, it's they need more troops for force protection to protect the embassy staff who are evacuating. And I guess whatever, civilians at the airport need to go or something like that. But eh, they apparently aren't in any danger. You know, again, I've been talking with this uh, army officer. He's like, yeah, we're ready to go swoop in there and blast everybody to hell and in, in order because we don't leave a man behind and we're not going to let them kill our guys on the way out. But they don't seem to be trying it. At least last I checked, I hadn't heard anything like that. So, in fact, I just wrote a new article for antiwar.com that's going to run. It'll be running on Tuesday when people are listening to this. And it's about Trump and Biden blaming each other. And my argument in the article is, they should not be blaming each other. They should be blaming Bush and Obama. They're the ones who've done this. And Trump did escalate 
But it was, he was essentially had a gun to his head when they made him do it in the summer of 17. And he did, you know, really give an actual writ to Zalmay Khalilzad to negotiate an exit from that war. And then, as you said, Biden, you know, this is Biden's probably best day of his life, facing down his critics and saying, no, we are following through with this. Because look, he's got to deal with the reality of, of what's the alternative. He's going to drop 50,000 troops in there and start the war all over again. We're going to pick a new puppet government to rule in Kabul to replace the corrupt, absolute disaster that has been created over the last 20 years. Come on, as Joe Biden would say. Nobody could believe in that anymore. You know, and just as a personal anecdote here, and I know this isn't a representative sample, Tom, but I've been going around giving speeches to mostly libertarian party groups, but also other groups all around the country. And I've had a lot of war veterans. I don't know, more than 50, more than, I mean, this year only, I mean, I don't know how many, but certainly more than 50 just this year come up. And you would think that some of them would tell me that they hate my guts and I'm stupid and I don't know what I'm talking about, but they never do. They always come up and tell me, hey, thanks for explaining to me what it was I was stuck in the middle of that I hated so much and that, and I know you're right. And boy, when you say this thing, that's where I was and this and that and whatever. And we're the fastest friends. And they're uh, some substantial minority of the audience of my show. And I think everybody knows I'm no veteran. I'm a skateboarder. You know, I'm not, I don't come from that culture necessarily at all, but I just tell the truth. And I'm not, I'm certainly not trying to beat them over the head with it. I'm just here you know, if they want to know what it is and I get nothing but appreciation for it, you know? And look, go back to a decade ago and what happened, Tom? It was the number one recipient of donations and presumably votes from active duty and veterans in the military was our guy, Ron Paul, the anti-war Republican who was dedicated to the Constitution, the same one they took their sacred oath to that they risked their life and limb in the name of and, you know, watch their friends die in the name of. And that's who they supported for president. And no mystery why, right? Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, the official razor of the Tom Woods Show, that is Harry's. The reason it's the official blade of the Tom Woods Show is that in the old days, I used to think I just can't shave with a blade. I have to shave with an electric because every time I shave with a blade, I wind up all cut up in a bloody mess. Well, it turns out that's not because I was using a blade. It's because I was using a terrible blade. Harry's gives me a smooth, close, comfortable shave every single time. And at a great price, too, as low as $2 per blade. And those blades are designed to stay sharp. In a recent study, guys who shave four times a week said their eighth shave was as smooth as their first. The Harry's design team combined a weighted ergonomic handle with their signature German-engineered blade cartridge. The result? Shaving awesomeness. In fact, Harry stands behind the quality of their blades so much, they offer a 100% money-back guarantee on harrys.com. You won't need to use that guarantee because these blades have the Tom Woods seal of approval. While Harry's is giving their best offer to Tom Woods show listeners, new Harry's customers can redeem a starter set. You get a five-blade razor, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel with aloe, and a travel cover to protect your blades when you're on the go. That's a $13 value for just $3. There's truly never been a better time to try Harry's. Go to harrys.com slash woods to try Harry's today. Well, all right, look, I got a couple more things I want to, I, let's go back for a second to the the issue of, yeah, look, I agree that we need to get out, but it was the way he went about. I guess what I'm not understanding about what they're saying there is that when you get your, your rear end kicked as hard as the U.S. did in this situation, and when you've been basically propping up something phony for all these years, namely the the supposedly widely supported Afghan government and then the 300,000 fighting people that they supposedly trained and all that, when that's not actually real, that's not actually a thing, when you leave, what did you think that would look like? I mean, is there some manual that you just follow that says, well, when you're leaving a situation in which you've absolutely gotten your rear end kicked out of your body practically, here's the simple way to get out where everybody's happy. Right. You know, like what do they propose be done? No, what the manual says is when you're getting your ass kicked like this, here's how to pretend that all the bad decisions were made in the last 72 hours and that this is nobody's fault, especially not the people whose fault it is. And if it's anybody's fault, you know, maybe it's Joe Biden and one or two generals, or maybe it's Donald Trump who put him in this situation. But it's certainly not 
every single person at the Council on Foreign Relations and the Center for a New American Security and the American Enterprise Institute and the Heritage Foundation and the Brookings Institute, and certainly not the fault of all these generals in the Marine Corps and the U.S. Army who have pushed and pushed to escalate and escalate and continue this war. And all the media people who carried their water this whole time. Man, I remember back a decade ago now, Jeremy Scahill from The Intercept now debating with Max Boot over the Afghan surge in 2000 and I guess 10, right? Like right as it's really getting heated up. And Scahill's over there interviewing the Taliban in the Helmand province. You got to give credit to that guy, man. I ain't going over there and interviewing the goddamn Helmand province. Are you kidding me? And here he's just whooping on Max Boot. And Max Boot just knows better. Nuh uh. All we have to do is escalate this war and it's going to work great, et cetera, et cetera. Listen, everybody who said that this whole time, they were all wrong this whole time. Uh, from seven years of W. Bush and eight years of Barack Obama and the four years of Trump, all the hawks who pushed Trump to escalate and escalate that war, all the think tankers and all the hacks, they were all wrong. They're all Michelle Flournoy. They should all absolutely be fired right out of American public life, all of them. And there are ditches to be dug. There ain't no shame in working hard. These people should be out in the sun working hard. We're tired of hearing their opinions. Yeah, well, I, I couldn't agree more. Honestly, and then of course there's some people on the right wing who have kind of taken this the right way, which has been good to see. That this goes to show how pointless this was. And if we, as Biden himself said, if we stayed another year, another five years, wouldn't have been any different. Of course, I mean, how can you not get that? But then you get these YAF Young Americans for Freedom people, you know, saying, "Ah, oh, this this shows we need a tougher president." Ah, oh, people are hopeless. But the person I guess I felt like was the most hopeless on this. Did you see Marianne Williamson? Now, just yes or no. I'll get, we'll get to it in a second. Did you see what yes, she said? Yes, so. Okay. She responded to Bill Crystal. Bill Crystal, of course, you know, wants every war to go on forever. And she said, well, you know, in this case, I have to say because of women's rights, I'm, I have to agree with you. And this is really going to be very bad for women. So she's, when push comes to shove, she'll use the same excuses for empire that the empire itself uses, even though they have absolutely, they could not, as we can see from the other regimes in the region that they are very happy to have pleasant meals with and get along just fine. They obviously don't really care about women's rights. But I can understand how a superficial observer looking at this would say, well, if the U.S. were still there, maybe the assaults against women's rights that we may observe in the coming weeks and months wouldn't occur. So what does Scott Horton say to that? Well, the Taliban are ruthless and they are backwards and medieval about that. The first point is, well, as far as she goes, I just want to say there are a lot of things wrong with leftists and as libertarians and somewhat, you know, right wingers, a lot of critiques of leftists are sound, but the leftist critique of liberals has value. And Marianne Williamson is exactly what a leftist thinks a liberal is. You know, it's just the worst kind of, it's like a neocon to a libertarian, right? It's the horror movie funhouse version of their principled take. And so here's this idiot lady would start a whole war all over again in the name of women's rights. She announces the day before it's completely lost, right? Oh, well, thank you for, you know, chiming in. You could have let us know your master plan a year and a half ago when it would have made a difference or something, Marianne. But now, I mean, what kind of, they call that virtue signaling? I don't know. I don't like using jargon, but... Yeah. You know, look at me. I'm a good person because I think we should keep occupying Afghanistan because the Taliban are bad on women's rights. And you're announcing this on August the 14th. Yeah, I don't know, man. And then as far as that goes, yes, the Taliban are ruthless, but two major points. The Pashtun Wali code that rules the Pashtun tribes is far more ancient than Islam and is as backwards as any honor code in anywhere in world history you ever heard of. Maybe not more, but at least as. And they treat, under the Pashtun Wali Code, women are treated essentially as livestock. But that's not true under even the most strict forms of Islam. And so, for example, this is in Anand Gopal's book, No Good Men Among the Living. 
on the all important question of whether women can inherit and own and buy and sell property, the Taliban say yes. And, you know, that is like a huge move, forgive me, to the left. <laughs> that makes them progressives compared to the ancient ways of these valleys where these people live. And so that's one thing, you know, for a lot of the people in the country. Secondly, yes, it's true that women have lived much more free lives, especially in the northern cities, I'm sure. And some of them will be living much more constricted lives now under Taliban rule. I don't think there's really any arguing about that. However, just think if we had not done a regime change against the Taliban. And, you know, it's in Bob Woodward's book, Bush at War, that Condoleezza Rice, the National Security Advisor, and the CIA were advising, let's just kill Arabs. Let's not take the war to the Taliban. We can, we can let the Taliban know we're not interested in messing with them, and we'll just focus on killing bin Laden and his friends. And Rumsfeld and Bush and Cheney and Wolfowitz and them, they refused. They had to expand the war to the Taliban so they could expand it to wherever the hell they wanted after that, especially Iraq after that. He didn't want a limited war. But just let's say, forget the negotiations. And let's just say for the sake of argument, as most people understand it, that they had to go out there to get bin Laden. But what if they'd just done that and left the Taliban in power the whole time and just proved that, see, we don't mean you guys any harm. Bill Clinton had just supported their rise to power only five years before that, Tom. And then what if we spent 10 years, 20 years telling them, man, you guys really need to improve your women's rights. And... We'll give you even better prices on something. I don't know. We, you know, try to be nice to them and encourage them over 20 years that you guys really need to make some reforms. And that situation would be a lot better by now, I'm sure. And by the way, the people that they're replacing in certain places, if not, you know, in downtown Kabul, they also have been absolutely horrible on women's rights and everybody else's rights too. I mean, absolutely ruthless warlords who don't care whatsoever about, you know, what Sarah Chase from NPR thinks about women's rights over there. I mean, they passed a law legalizing marital rape and legalizing even starving your wife if she won't give in to sex demands and this kind of thing. And just absolutely crazy. And then the warlords that they put in power are people like Pacha Khan Zardari, who was like the most famous child rapist in the country. And George W. Bush and Hamid Karzai made him a governor of two different provinces, in fact. I think Nangohar and Helmand. I forgot. Helmand was one of them, and then I forgot. Maybe Ghazni, uh, where he's not even from. So I mean, these are guys who rape and torture and kill women and children. Ann Jones, the great um, journalist who spent years over there, who I've interviewed many times, she uh, wrote, has written, and has told me that the number one, this is circa five years ago, the number one preoccupation of the Afghan military and police forces is chasing down runaway women and girls. That's their number one job in the country to do. That's who we've been supporting in power this whole time. So yes, the Taliban suck, particularly on this issue. But the people that they're replacing are no angels, as the New York Times would say, if a cop shot them dead. Well, I'm going to conclude this episode. By the way, I appreciate those points uh, showing that it's not quite so simple and cartoonish as Marianne Williamson would make you believe. I'll tell you, there's a story. It's in the book, Fools Aaron Tom, where these three Marines were working out in the gym and the police chief who they were installing in power in Kandahar province his teenage sex slave came in and shot them all to death and killed them as revenge against them hoisting this monster on him. And then they covered it up and they tried to fire the whistleblower. Yeah, I didn't know about that story. (laughs) That's the Americans' war in Afghanistan. Yeah. Imagine you sign your boy up for the Marines and that's how he dies. A child sex slave of a police chief shoots him in the back. I just saw somebody on Twitter saying with sorrow that he overheard some older military guy saying that under the circumstances, I just cannot recommend a career in the military to anybody I know or my children or grandchildren or whatever. And he was very sad about that. And I retweeted it saying, this is the one bit of good news. (laughs) This is the thing to, of course, that's what we want. Uh, Of course, I don't want to- Afghanistan syndrome. Yeah. 
Yeah, our government considers it a mental illness. We should celebrate that. Just like in Vietnam, just like I've been saying all along and a lot of other great people too, empire is murder-suicide. Empire is the worst thing about America, the worst thing for America. And we could just call it off because we have no real enemies anywhere in the world, so it's easy. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Well, people at, at a time like this, it's important to know the story of what happened because it's, you know, it, everybody's looking at what's happening in the last two weeks or something, but you really should know the story that got us here because any story that ends this way is a fascinating story and it involves your country, Americans who are listening to this episode, you should know that story and there's no better storyteller on it than Scott Horton here. So you should read his book, Fool's Errand. I'll, of course, link to it on the show notes page, which would be tomwoods.com slash 1952. So go get your copy on that. You'll know more than anyone in the world on this subject other than Scott himself. And you need to know it. You need to know the story of this fiasco. Scott, you were very flexible with me today. I had to jump through some bureaucratic hoops today and you accommodated me. So thank you for doing this and for just being Scott Horton. We all love you. Anytime, my friend. Thank you. Oh, and by the way, by the way, before you go, scotthorton.org is your website. And I want to remind people that even though Scott and I are friends, like real personal friends, Scott comes to town, we go out for dinner, things like that, okay? Even though you might think there'd be some awkwardness in this, there isn't. I donate money to Scott every month. You know, fairly decent chunk of dough every month because I like what Scott is doing and I want him to keep doing it. I want there to be more Scott Horton out there. And even if my donation didn't make the difference between there being a Scott Horton show and there not being one, I feel like I owe it to him. All the good work he does, all the stuff he teaches me, I just want him to have it. I don't care if it keeps his show on the air. I don't care if it goes right up his nose, frankly. I Well, okay, maybe it will, probably I, w- I wouldn't want that. But the point is, I do it because I feel like it's the right thing to do. If, if a guy like this isn't being supported by libertarians, then all our arguments about the free society supporting content creators aren't worth a hill of beans. So go to scotthorton.org and join me. Be like Woods. If somebody gives you value, you support that person. And Scott absolutely deserves our support. So go to his website, donate to the Scott Horton Show. Now we're done with the episode. Thank you again, Scott. Thank you. All right, everybody, before we wrap up for today, one of my listeners created this website, gunloot.com, and it's mostly peaceful merchandise is the way he describes it. So you can get T-shirts and hats and mugs with all kinds of fun, subversive messages on them. Like, if I can pretend your mask works, you can pretend I'm wearing one. Or this shirt identifies as a mask or defy your local tyrant, or COVID-1984, all kinds of fun, subversive stuff over at gunloot.com. So check them out, gunloot.com. I'll link to them on the show notes page, tomwoods.com slash 1952. Check out tomwoods.com slash publicity if you would like to find out how to get a shout out for a website you are thinking of creating. Got to get your hosting through my link, and then I will help you get some traffic to that site plus give you some free tutorials and other goodies that will get you up and running super fast. All these things cost you now one extra cent. Just check out the details at tomwoods.com slash publicity. Tomorrow, our old friend Murray Sabrin comes back to the show. We're gonna talk about, he has a brand new book on healthcare showing how we can get out of this horrible mess where people wind up going bankrupt because the prices are completely out of whack. And we have to talk about that, fix that problem. So we're going to do that tomorrow. So subscribe to The Tom Woods Show, and I'll see you then. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at Podsworth.com.